Great, thank you. Okay, sorry. All right. Yes, yeah, so I already told the slides over. Let's turn to the beginning of what I'm going to talk about. So um, let me start from just an overview of the problem. And uh, as said in our um, abstract, I'm going to talk about two methods that we try on this. So the problem in our traditional statistical literature is called two sample. We essentially try to com uh, compare two distributions given in a simple setting, I the samples from them. So you, you can call X is a uh, finite many samples drawn from distribution P, and the Y is a data set, a uh, finite sample drawn from distribution Q, the two are independent, and the uh, data can be in multivariate dimension or high dimension, well, the distribution P and Q generally is not known, but you're just given the samples. And uh, the question is how to compare it, but comparing is not a precise words. So quantitatively speaking, you want to ask um, how the density P is different from Q, which has a various applications. I'm going to give a few examples here. So um, on the left, if you can see my cursor, you have that flow cytometry, which we also uh, briefly introduced today as an application. So the, as a, a biological problem here is you want to compare the two biological conditions. And what you are given is the uh, specimen, which usually is a, a tube of, for example, blood, blood that has uh, tens of thousands of cells. Um, and each cell under this uh, technology is going to be uh, measured um, to become a vector. So uh, once there is in a, a point in a space and you have and each tube of blood will give you a data cloud. And that data cloud uh, uh, is corresponds to one subject. And you can imagine as plotted here, uh, the problem of comparing uh, different density is by comparing these different clouds. So it's actually the distribution that matters and has biological information to reveal what is the condition of, of the, this subject. On the right is the uh, more recent technology of the single cell uh, RNA data. Um, so here, uh, specifically, this data set is for um, melanoma patients, and you have non-responder and a responder, which you can think of is the X and, and Y, and the biological difference is also encoded in difference of the distributions of which we call P and, and Q, and uh, here is the low-dimensional embedding of the higher-dimensional uh, measurements. And again, the, the problem here is trying to compare distribution by comparing clouds. And also we can have comparing different groups. If you think a group is also generally can be viewed as uh, a, a data cloud box. All right. So when we talk about high dimensional data and the to solve a problem, think on the left, you have this two density typically, maybe this is Gaussian, this is, this is in two dimension, but you can say high dimensional Gaussian. Well, another more uh, practical case is actually a problem uh, that is encountered in the uh, computer vision of the image synthesis. And then here is the uh, output of, the, uh, of a generated model, which the problem there is you can have data sets, which are the authentic images and the uh, fake ones, well, generated by the model. And in the, in the GAN, which is a generated adversary network, typically the GNET, which is a generator, is to produce these fake images and the authentic ones, you, I mean, and the fake ones are sent to this called DNet, which is discriminator, that classify if uh, this DNet can successfully distinguish the real from the fake, and that is used as uh, 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 to send the, the gradient to help to uh, improve the GNet such that the two distribution is the same. So if you view in terms of comparing the distribution, what the GAN is doing for this problem is actually training a classifier network. And it turns out the idea of training a, a classifier for the problem of two sample is also uh, rooted in earlier statistical literature. So the advantage of a network approach, like in many other places, is the combination of uh, scalability also in terms of memory. So I mean, to, to notice here, uh, in many applications, not just the uh, biomedical data, high dimensional data clouds is actually things like this. Here, you, um, the, each data point is an image, which is in the uh, high dimensional pixel space of, uh, of pixel values, uh, rather than idealized case like this. So that you can see, uh, I mean, when we talk about data and comparing uh, distribution in, uh, of the data in, in higher or media dimension, so we can see there are, let's say, the two, basically two types of questions if here, just as an example. The first is a uh, very important case, like if you have two Gaussian in high dimension and uh, let's say they 
just have the same covariance, but with a shift of mean. So in this case, you can see that the data is really high dimension because maybe, I mean, the variation is indeed, right? And the problem of how you can detect if there is a shift mean, of course, is an important one. So this is one type of problem. There is another type of problem, which well, can be related to the first one, is when your data, although in high dimension exactly like uh, do some low dimensional structure, but in the case of the uh, bi biological me me uh, data sets, like I just mentioned, as you can from, see from the visualization, there are certain uh, either lines or, or, or submanifolds or clusters, which means that the data has some low dimensional structure, although it's actually embedded in high dimension. Another important case is images, especially image patches. So here is MNIST, a very simple image data set. It's again, manifold-like, okay, if you want to call that. Or, I mean, for the, for the images, the ambient space is the pixel space. So comes a very natural question, like in this problem, what role is the data geometry playing? And uh, I mean, we think that uh, data geometry can be important. And uh, that should be reflected in the, both in the methods and as well as in the analysis of such projects. Any question? All right. So um, I, I think I will be short of time, but uh, I, uh, the original plan is to cover uh, two parts of in this talk. So in part one, I'm going to introduce our recent work on the uh, so-called anisotropic kernel MMD that will introduce an an anisotropic kernel uh, in a measure of the kernel distance, I'm going to give a brief review of uh, what is the uh, definition of that. And uh, we, we'll provide analysis of the testing power in terms of distinguishing the two densities. And uh, the, the point there is actually the power is characterized by the kernel spectrum, which is actually uh, for, for kernel, then it's the spectral decomposition of the kernel. And we talk about application and flow cytometry. And the second part, um, which is not the kernel approach, but the neural network approach. We're going to introduce so-called the logit test. And uh, it's uh, as a methodology, it's actually the same idea of training a classifier of a neural network for the problem. And in the approximation and aspiration analysis, we kind of uh, extend the previous uh, manifold approximation result using neural network, but has two new elements. First, uh, our estimation error bounds is actually built upon a literal regulation. And the message here is, if you can um, have potentially larger and a larger family of the neural network function space that approximate a function on the manifold at the same time, keep that function to have say finite leaches in the ambient space, which is important for such problem. And also in many applications, the traditional case that the data is lying on the manifold will be too idealistic. And uh, it's important to consider the near manifold density. We'll also incorporate that into this analysis. And uh, in both the approximation and estimation error bounds, I'm going to explain in terms of uh, a specific setting, uh, we obtain um, so-called intrinsically that it overcome the curse of dimensionality, um, which we will explain. All right. So start from the kernel MD approach. For those who already know this, this uh, is the classical setting and has a, a history of work for uh, a so-called maxi uh, maximum mean discrepancy. So the general MMD is actually over a general class of function and function is the test of function. It's also called the, the, the integral, uh, the probably integral measure, uh, with different names. And uh, we are foc what we're focusing is the reproducing kernel Hilbert space that is when you restrict this calligraphic F, which is space of test function. Oops, there is some voice, okay. Um, all good, all right. To be uh, the unit ball. So this H here just means the L2 norm in the kernel space. So you want to restrict that to the two norm of F is, is unit. And then uh, this test function we have for the specific kernel uh, here space, we have an explicit solution, which is this quadratic form, okay? And uh, this is a population squared uh, MND distance, and it has a, a empirical version. A naive way is just to compute this kernel matrices, which can be computed as long as you have the data, so even dimension D. And uh, you have the kernel matrix computed from X and X, X and Y, and uh, Y and Y, and you just take this uh, uh, naively unsquare optimization you, uh, uh, computation, you get this quantity. 
Now, what we're trying to bring here is actually the kernel spectrum that we shall see is going to inject the data geometry. So what do I mean? So this is a squared MMD. Okay, in terms of uh, quadratic form involving this kernel, this K can be, a, a, for example, Gaussian or something. Now, if you write that kernel into this spectral decomposition of eigenvalue and the eigenfunction, which generally exists with respect to certain density, certain L2 space, then you can just rewrite this line in this infinite summation over the uh, uh, eigenvalues and, eigen, uh, and the projection to eigenfunctions. So in other words, it's just a change coordinate into the feature space by the eigenfunctions and this become a weighted L2 distance squared. Okay. Now, this projection to eigen mode, you can see will can characterize how much each psi k as an eigenfunction is going to see the difference of the two densities. Okay, just as a, uh, coordinates. Now, lambda k can be interpreted as weights, and the ck, which just to give it a notation, is going to be uh, the coordinate. Now, if we see a spectral decomposition like this, there are ideas coming from the traditional manifold learning. When we talk about manifold learning, we think about data points sampled on a manifold. Here, I'm uh, giving a ball and sphere, and here is a little tiny, is a heat kernel that you can build on manifold. But of course, I commend other examples. And uh, so what we remember there is uh, the eigenpair, eigenfunction, and the uh, uh, eigenvalues of the kernel uh, in the limit of kernel, kernel bandwidth go to zero can converge to certain uh, differential operators on the manifold. For example, when density is uniform, you can just recover the Laplace and Beltrami operator. And uh, if uh, it's not uniform, we go to the focal Planck. Uh, so back to the finite sample case, for, five, for finite size kernel matrices computed from finite many samples, this kernel matrix will have so-called spectral convergence. That means that the empirical eigenvalue and eigenvector can also can approximate the uh, limiting eigenvalue and eigenfunctions determined by the density and the, and the geometry. And uh, you can say that, argue that if the density, the data is actually going off the manifold, but not very far, then by thanks to the robustness of the uh, kernel matrices, this uh, the kind of patterns or those approximation will also persist. So let's see that on an example. And I'm going to introduce the idea of the uh, anisotropic kernel. So this is the first example of so-called manifold. Here is actually flat, so it's just a square. And your kernel is a Gaussian kernel with certain bandwidth. And uh, if you compute the population eigenvalue and the eigenfunction of this case, what you get, well, this is numerical solution, so it's an artifact by the, by the multiplicity, but you can see, we know that the eigenfunction is going to be sines and cosines because here the dimension is two. So you can split in the north, uh, north, northwest and uh, east, east or west and the north south, all right. Alternatively, uh, well, if your manifold is instead of being a square, actually become a rectangle, so kind of elongated in one direction, short in another direction, uh, and a limit it can approximate like a one dimensional manifold, if you think that's going to be, and you still use this kernel, which is isotropic, you're not going to get uh, low lying eigenvalues, in this case, sorted by uh, small, from small to large of eigenvalues. The low lying eigen uh, functions split it faster you can go it, it, along the direction of x which is the long direction okay and in the limit you can see that this is sine and sine and uh, sine x and sine 2x and so on now what if you actually want to manipulate the spectrum and uh, recover the harmonics like the square case for your purpose for, for example for our purpose here will be the two sample problem what you can do is you can do an anisotropic kernel here such that the constructed kernel will be exactly covered with the squared case. So you can place a little uh, game there. And um, that's actually the intuition. So I'm just quickly give the, uh, uh, here, back to this spectral way of writing the square MMD, which is known. If we think about the data like this, this example is similar to the strip, but here is you have a manifold, which is nearly one dimension and a lie in the two dimensional space. And the differentiating density Q is departing from P in the direction that is orthogonal to it. 
So you will think that uh, eigenfunctions that is splitting along that normal direction will be more useful to detect the departure. And uh, if you use a round Gaussian kernel isotropic one, here is what you're going to get. As you, as you can see, as same as the previous page, uh, the splitting is faster along the, the long direction and uh, those are not going to be useful for detecting this departure. However, if you use uh, ellipse that are going a little bit along the manifold rather than into the orthogonal direction, you're going to obtain this mode here that's going to be useful to detect this departure. So that's the toy example. And the message here is, well, if you use anisotropic kernel adaptive in the right way, it can help the kernel distance to be more sensitive to certain departures. And uh, I guess I can skip some of the formal setup. Uh, I mean, if you're interested, you can always read. So the specific anisotropic thing is actually constructed in this uh, rectangle way to make the uh, computation faster. Also, this is called the mean embedding test. You can have this, uh, it's called reference set. If we write it as a distribution, it can, in practice, can be a finite set, which is a point that you want to measure the uh, different abundance of the two densities. And that abundance is computed uh, with this tensor, this gamma r at each point is going to encode that uh, an, an anisotropic covariance, like in the previous uh, picture. And the kernel, which is uh, the K, which is always uh, positive semi-definite, is going to be intuitively the AA transpose. But here it just is in the integral form. Um, so if this anisotropic kernel A has a singular value decomposition, this kernel matrix K will have a spectral decomposition. And the eigenvalue is going to be single value squared. And the right single vector is going to be eigenfunction. And uh, the other thing is, as an uh, example I'm going to show, you can also apply the idea of, of the uh, manifold filtering that we can change these weights to be something else, as long as you can estimate the eigenfunctions. And by playing the weights here, we can also uh, change the behavior of the statistic, as, as long as they're sufficiently decayed. So you guarantee the estimation accuracy of this. Now, as the toy example, these are the histograms of the test statistic. And by the test statistic, I just mean this empirical uh, MD distance square. Uh, this is a newer case that two density is the same. This is you have a slight departure, but you can see the modulation by design in the orthogonal direction. You should see that the anisotropic kernel is not sensitive to this, but the, this is isotropic. The, the anisotropic isotropic kernel is going to see a difference even at this stage, given finite samples. And well, if you are if you just have larger modulation, then both methods are going to see uh, the difference of the two densities. So. As I suggested, uh, it turns out that the power analysis by this squared statistic can be related to the uh, spectral decomposition of the function. So theoretical setup, we consider um, certain assumptions that uh, the, well, the A2 is that corresponds to that kernel is characteristic, that your you know, Q indeed is in the space, that your kernel can see the difference. And uh, theoretically, we consider this uh, family of departures. So you have a G is a difference of two density and tau is a scalar and tau zero P is the same as Q and the tau changes how much you deviate it. And uh, um, we consider the balance case. That is when the uh, size of the two data sets X and Y is proportional to each other. And the first result is about the convergence of limiting density that what we call T is the squared M and D and under different uh, asymptotic scenarios, that the departure is, is uh, uh, not large enough, which is the first case, uh, tau equals one, which is, uh, is the third case, and the tau equals two is the critical case. Okay? Under the different scenarios, we could have uh, different uh, limiting densities. Uh, of course, you scaled, for example, for the chi-square distribution, the scale can be any front. And the case two and the case three is going to be normal density, but with uh, specific scaling so that it has an order one limit. The proof of this is just, a, 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 I would say, a central limit theorem, but because, as you can see, if after switching to the uh, spectral coordinates, it's going to be square sums, independent sums. And you, you in central limit theorem, you replace them by the uh, limiting of random variables and you, you can prove the convergence of the distribution. And if you have a result of the limiting density, 
and the asymptotic cons consistency of the test that you can guarantee to see a difference if your p is indeed different or q can be uh, also proved. And we the, at the so-called critical regime, that is the think of tau is uh, going to zero as n is in large, this scaling is tau is with square root of n, which is Monte Carlo rate. Um, also, we can prove a lower bound. If you compute the moments of this, the good news is, thanks to the fact that the T1 can be written in terms of the spectral decomposition, you can compute also the variance of it explicitly. And these quantities can be all written in terms of the eigenvalues. And the CK is the projections along the eigenfunctions. So I'd be better to see that in the toy example. I'm using the same toy example all the time here. And, uh, in the lower, this is the data. In the lower panel, we just uh, examine three kernels. The first is a Gaussian kernel, isotropic one. The second is just using this uh, locally anisotropic kernels. The third one is by the uh, manipulation of the weights of the FK to design a different weights, okay, rather than the eigen uh, values. So this is the test power as indicated by the color. The manipulated one is the best. The anisotropic is better. Uh, the Gaussian is the worst in these cases. And uh, below, the dashed line is the limiting density. And the uh, solid line is the empirical distribution. As you can see, uh, it converges to the limiting density pretty fast. As here, I think, uh, number of sample just uh, like hundreds, or two hundreds, or something. So to be able to see why the spectral decomposition is illustrative about the testing power, and here is what we compute. As we suggested, it is the CK square and the lambda K and their summation that is giving you a meaningful uh, kind of bias or accumulate enough uh, difference when P and Q are different. So here the question is, can we categorize by per eigen mode? So here the X axis is the index of eigenvalues from small to large. And uh, uh, on the right, this you can view this as the contribution from each eigen uh, index. So let's look at the Gaussian kernel first, which is the blue dots. You can see um, when k is small, these values are not large, but when k is relatively large, it starts to have certain uh, contribution. And these are computed from the, the, limit, the limiting um, numerical approximation of the analytic eigen decomposition of the, of the functions. So intuitively, this means that these uh, coordinates will be discriminative for the to differentiate the two densities. However, the Gaussian kernel is giving all the weights to the low line ones, and it does not give them enough weights here. And also they are high index, which means that estimation is usually not so good. So this is for Gaussian kernel. Well, if you switch to this anisotropic kernel, which is red, you can see that start to have certain discriminative ones at the low index of, of K, which is the same picture if you remember that it starts to split along the normal direction early in K. So that's the same phenomenon here. And the black one is the uh, spectral filter manipulation, which is, you, you can see from the left, that eigenvalue is enlarged and uh, why that's helpful I mean, in this example, the contribution is coming from these low lying ones. We're just using the eigenvalues of the uh, AA transpose. It does not give it enough weights. But if you manipulate it, you just uh, get a little bit more bump in terms of the discriminative power. All right. I think I can skip this application. Um, under uh, flow cytometry, about biological data. Um, and here, um, to discriminate the two conditions of uh, of patients, we use the anotropic and it's doing better than the isotropic kernel. And I'm going to talk about uh, uh, moving to the neural network approach. Should, so, should, can, I, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, yes. So, so, so for the so general given data, is there any mechanism? So how do you choose that weight function or what's the... Weight function. You have this anisotropic. I have different ways to choose that this anisotropic. Yes, kernel. there are certainly many ways. You mean the the covariance, the the, yeah. the gamma r. I don't so, know. Uh, you, yeah. just, you have some principle. Uh, the the method of pre okay. Our formulation okay assumes gamma r is given to us. Yes. Uh, in, yeah. For, well, of course, the theory does not tell you how to do that. In That's practice, we do local PCA. Yeah. Wait. So, so you have a real data and you, you, you use the local PCA to fraction? We use local PCA to get something like this. But <laughs> that part involves uh, adaptive you know, setting of the covariance matrix. 
and uh, that's not covered by our analysis yet. Oh, I, I see, I see. I have a question yeah. on this slide yeah. right here, when, when you're done. Yeah. Um, in the delta, what's the delta? Is that how much shift there is, or? Delta. And, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, it's not oh, a delta. Oh, you mean? It's, uh, yeah, delta. it is a delta, yeah. Yeah, yeah what oh, is it? Yes, I think this measures this, okay. Uh, in, in an example, we use delta in the numerical example. It actually measures the shifts of the density. So oh, when so delta is zero, the, that's yeah. why the two densities is the same. And this okay. is called the testing level, which you usually said to be uh, 0 0.05. So like you, you want to control the false positive. So okay, I was just guessing with that. So that was just, you're just shifting out that. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of larger departure that everyone gets power. And the competition yeah. is we have a small departure when you start to see the difference earlier. Okay, and using the same amount of data and all that. Okay, uh, yes. it's just I just took density parameter I popped out. So okay. here is, yeah, when data is zero, they are the same. And okay. when data is it just change a lot, a lot of, according to the direction, I call it G or something. And, and when you calculate this, how does it compare computationally with uh, the cost for com computing it, you know, like the more simple one or whatever, you know, when I just use uh, the so If you have more simple one, the original one is n square computation. There are actually many words of accelerating the computation. Let me go to this original one. Ah, where is it? So here, ah, that's the formulation. Um, okay, so good question about computation. So we, we actually follow the case that you do it on the reference set. So in the cases that you can choose reference set to be smaller, uh, the, it's a rectangle matrix of uh, size of reference set and data set, which is n r by n. And originally, if you compute the kernel matrix, n by n. But choosing the reference set is going to be you know, also involve a heuristic or way how to choose it. So I think in practice, if you, uh, we, we use the pivoting QR or something to set reasonable reference set. Generally, if you can set a reasonable reference set, it's going to reduce the computation. And it's similar to so-called the mean embedding test, which I think I have a citation after all this. Yes, on this slide. So this mean embedding test is, a op is a, I think maybe one of these papers is optimized for both the kernel bandwidth as a trainable parameter, also locations. So they also optimize location, assuming they have a training set. In our case, we just uh, assume that you can do a reference set and that will, will reduce the computation. Okay, so I, I, also I jumped ahead of here. Go ahead. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Uh, so, so sorry, Shuvan. So, so as as you mentioned, so if 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 for the you you basically approximate the tangent space. So how how good of this approximation when you really handle like high dimension? Well, I understand it's like low dimension in the high dimension space, but is that uh, the the way to approximate the unnecessary kernel? Use the PCA. Would that be give you some okay approximation? Local covariance estimation is tricky. I uh, definitely That's agree what I'm with thinking. you. Yes, it's yes. so uh, we are in our application, for example, this one, well, this is not to define anything. This one, uh, the thing is if you use isotropic model, it's uh, you, you don't get any kind of any distinction or name something, but you, so such that you kind of using a local uh, PCA to get monobis distance actually help you to get dis distinct, uh, more, more dis discriminative. Uh, features mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. It helps to improve the kernel. It does not give you the perfect estimation of tangent space for sure because tangent estimation yeah. can be tricky. I definitely agree with you. Oh, that's yeah. why, that's, uh, to be honest, that's why in our analysis we assume that it's given and just say that the kernel is good, then oh. you have this power. But right. uh, we do not uh, prove you are definitely getting good kernel because that also involves the estimation of the covariance uh, tensor. Uh, that, that sigma r and uh, that introduce more uh, dependence and it's it's not going to be a same, uh, the same analysis. I see, I see, thanks. So for an uh, example that I didn't show, that is another example in our paper we have that diffusion MRI. In that case, the anisotropic tensor that we provided to you give in that specific application. So if you have such information, you can use it. And you do not need to estimate it. But generally, if you have data set in higher dimension, the idea is you don't want to waste your, your, your kernel into all those directions that is orthogonal to your manifold. So you yeah, want to make them like ellipse a bit. So that can help you a bit. Sure. So, all right. Okay. Um, 
more question? Very good, thanks. All right. Um, okay, so I, um, talking about shortcomings, we talk about computation. Um, for kernel approach, although it's more provable than the neural network I'm gonna talk about in some cases, in practice there is a problem, apart from computation, the question is how to find a good kernel. And you end up, there's some literature end up training a good kernel by certain optimization um, and uh, get an advantage by just using a Gaussian kernel. We try to use anisotropic kernel, but uh, as mentioned by uh, Professor Lai, uh, how to estimate the right covariance matrix can, is another question. And also in the literature that is work, um, in the literature of GAN, they try to use a neural network to average the power of the expressiveness of the network and uh, to kind of do a feature learning first so that you get and build a, a simple kernel so that in the end you get a more powerful kernel because the feature extraction part is by network and so on. And this just brings to the question of what if we can train a neural, a, a new, and to end a neural network to do such a uh, job as being done in the, in the game. So in the second part, I'm going to talk about what we try to do there. I'm going to introduce the classification network and the analysis of that. So um, neural network in this case is actually nothing different on some conceptual ways than any classifier. You can actually do a logistic regression or some other classifier if you want and uh, get uh, a, a logit function. Now, the setting is to just to be clear with uh, using this approach, there, there is a way with, well, you can do resampling, but the simple way is you split your data. Also, likewise, in other, the previous current approach, when there is a training part, because you don't want your uh, training to overlap the dependence with your testing. So you split your data of X and Y, use half of it to train a model and you compute this two sample status, which is a global test on the testing set. So you waste half of the sample if you want. Um, neural network can be trained in practice uh, to your choice. And in the previous work, uh, which is in uh, 16, somehow the, the title the revisiting the classifier, uh, classification neural network for two sample, um, it's proposed to use very intuitively the uh, classification accuracy. So what is accuracy? If a data is from two data sets, X and Y, suppose X is red and Y is blue, they come with labels, which is binary. The question is, if they're, if they're the same uh, distribution, then you, you think, okay, I try and classify, I cannot classify them because that is, it is the same. So if you cannot classify them correctly, your class accuracy will be, will be bad and then means that distribution-wise they're the same. Otherwise, if you can successfully train a, a classifier with certain non-trivial accuracy, you'll think, okay, they're different uh, density. So that's the idea. If you formalize it, accuracy can be written in terms of indicator function of whether logit is greater than zero. And uh, you can just, uh, uh, in the case of the testing set is balanced the size, you can write this um, accuracy test statistic as a sample average of the function which is a logit and taking the sign and a take the sample average on the testing X and testing Y and take the difference. I mean, well, the question is why you need this sign here if you want to view this as a linear statistic, you can remove it as we said. So it's called, that's why we call it logit test. So you just take the logit, you take a sample average, you take the difference. This uh, in population wise will become the integral of F theta of P subtract Q. Then, I mean, that will be similar to the uh, NMD or IPM will, F theta will be the test function obtained by a neural network, which is the last layer there. So we call this the witness function, just to borrow the language of the kernel NMD. And uh, uh, just to re recall that in NMD, witness function is going to be the, it's actually a KDE if you want. So kernel estimate of the difference of two sensitivities at a point X. Some examples of how it works. So here we just uh, start from basic examples in one dimension. Again, uh, this is the same uh, notation of delta because we have that to control how the densities are different. The first is uh, the shift of mean of one. This is module change of variance. This is a growing a bump uh, at the tail. Uh, all parameterized by delta. And in first and first two case, also the lines here. Red and the pink are the network approach. 
and blue and green are the kernels. So what's the message? Forget about the dash line for a moment. On these two examples, network and the kernel are the slightly advantage here, maybe otherwise comparable. And the last case, the network kind of doing better than the kernel, especially this uh, logic one. And with dash, it's just because if you use kernel uh, methods, you can use all the samples, but if you use network, you have to split training and testing. So for a fair comparison, uh, you can compute uh, the test that is using all the samples for kernel. You can also post select. I mean, we, we cheat away with post select the bandwidth because bandwidth is a parameter in kernel use, Gaussian kernel in this case. So that as a more fair comparison, so it's definitely helping in like this case, where here again, even use that is not as for this specific example, appears not as good as a network approach. Well, a more complete data set, a more complicated data set, a one dimension, but definitely a simple data set for any uh, uh, application is MNIST. And uh, you just uh, try to detect the fake from the authentic as a two sample case, uh, two sample problem in dimension 700 ish. And uh, you compare the kernel case whenever, because you have two different uh, uh, densities, you're going to see when your red cross, which attests statistics, is going beyond your distribution of the law, which we, we can compute that so-called permutation test. That's just to make sure that it's, uh, it's a normal case. And uh, you can see that the network approach is doing better, also thanks to the fact that uh, neural network classifier here is more uh, powerful than just using the uh, Gaussian convolution kernel in the uh, ambient space. And uh, uh, we want to talk a bit about the weakness function. As that turns out to be the object we want to approximate using a neural network approximation. So as we said, in a kernel pro uh, case, weakness function is a difference of the density convolved with the kernel. And in this one dimensional case, P and Q differ by a bump. On the right, we show three cases of the kernel functions of the three approaches. Uh, the blue one is the weakness function of the kernel MMD. Uh, the one that has a discontinuity is the witness function, we call it population, which I'm going to explain. So that's kind of the, the, uh, the best uh, F, the perfect F in the classify optimization. And uh, recall that in the network accuracy test, it has a sign there. That's why it has a discontinuity. And uh, this curved one is uh, the population uh, witness function of the logit test, which turns out to be the log of the density ratio. That uh, uh, is the exact ma uh, maximizer of the Yenchen signal divergence. I'm going to talk about it. Okay, so if you think you can find these test functions, the question of if you can detect, uh, detect the departure is, is, are they going to give you a good statistic, which is the sample mean? And the sample mean is just central limit theorem. So we can compare the mean and standard deviation of the sample averages of these functions. And that's going to also uh, some simple calculation showing that uh, this has the best uh, power in terms of a large uh, va uh, bias and divided by variance. So I think I have 10 minutes maybe, <laughs> or I should leave some time for the questions. I, don't know. Um, I would maybe uh, go, so Longjie, do I have? Yeah, you have, you have 10, 10 minutes, definitely. 10 minutes. Uh -huh. we, we start at like 4.10, no worries. Right. So, okay, I will try to leave a few more minutes for questions. Now, this is the part about approximation and estimation analysis in this. So annotation a little bit heavy, but I, that for those who work on this, maybe it's somehow more familiar. For example, this is a GAN training object, if you want. It's just a logistic regression. Here is a logic. And the LN is the empirical objective that you want to maximize if you train a soft max classific classifier. You can write that into a population version just by replacing these guys to be the P and you get this. And as shown in the original uh, GAN paper, the maximizer is the uh, log of the density ratio, which we call F star. That's, we call, that's what we call the population weakness function for this logic thing. Whenever you fix a train F hat, for example, by empirically uh, optimizing this guy, you fix that as your test function. And in your training, you, you get that from training and the test is that is computed on the test set, which is, uh, Okay, I call it Y, it's confusing with X and Y, but I mean, it's on the test set of X and Y. Okay, that's split way and uh, independent. So condition on the trained F, which is from the training is independent of this. That's why test that is, is a simple, uh, can be characterized by a uh, simple 
uh, independent sum and the central limit theorem. The question will be, um, if I compute this test statistic, when can it be significantly greater than zero, which will indicate a, 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 a powerful test when P and Q is indeed different. So, well, the population version is this uh, linear statistic and by elementary lemma, this is lower bounded by L. I mean, this is the relation between T and L. And uh, this means that if our training can provide an L, which is this integral form of the function f hat, which is in the neural network family. If we want, if we can get it zero and ideally close to its I mean, absolute uh, maximum, which is the interesting divergence, suppose it's now zero, then we can get a so-called consistent test. The test is going to see the difference. And of course, like in any analysis of uh, neural network uh, 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 approach, the error has three parts, approximation error, estimation error, and optimization. So in our roadmap of analysis, we assume the Yenshin standard divergence is L evaluated as F star. We, F star may not be smooth, but with our assumption will be you have a smooth target that can give you similarly uh, large bias if you want, this bias here. And it's our assumption. You this F call means construction. We're going to, const uh, because it's constructive proof, of approximation error, we're going to construct a function in the neural network fam family, and you shall see it's a network approximation uh, result that is dealt away from that uh, uh, target. And of course, this is population. If you do finite by the uh, estimation error, which we're going to show the rate, you get it, uh, you sacrifice it here, which because there is error there. The optimization, if perfect, is going to get you here, which is guaranteed to be greater than that. However, that is usually not accessible, and what you're trained can, uh, in practice, uh, can be smaller than that. Our second assumption will be training is almost perfect. I know it's uh, going to be a problem, but I will assume it here. And that's going to bring you the finite sample here. And then use estimation again. It guarantees what we want, which is the population uh, bias of the trained uh, network function. So the three assumptions, the first you can have a smooth target function that will give you sufficient bias. The second is, uh, okay, this is A2 is the existence of this target. The first is training is almost perfect. The third one is an uh, interesting one is to guarantee our estimation error would take a different approach than some uh, existing theory in liter literature. We focus on the case that neural network functions are regularized to have a bounded Lipschitz, and that Lipschitz bound is the same even as epsilon go to zero. Okay. And that Lipschitz function is in ambient space, because although we think a density is near manifold, uh, we have a network function can apply to any point in the space. And this is highly illustrated in the adversarial examples. So we're interested in the uh, function to be uh, in RD, ambient space, has a finite Lipschitz. You can call that a regularization. And if you uh, guarantee this is, again, by finally bias this guy's version of zero, we can prove test consistency just by central limit zero. Um, I'm going to summarize the result here. So to be able to go beyond the manifold data, we consider near manifold data by the sub-Gaussian tail, such that you have a manifold, you consider all the density, such that it decays exponentially fast when you are uh, leaving, uh, deviating away from the manifold for such a class, which we call P sigma our approximation error result has the following form. Under those assumptions, we say that, how is the constructed F give you a bias L? It's going to be uh, uh, smaller, uh, different from the capital C, which is provided by the target function by the two, two terms. One is proportional to epsilon, and epsilon is the approximation, uniform approximation error provided by the network approximation. And there is also a sigma, which is this sub-Gaussian uh, width, if you want, of this neighborhood. And this constant are dependent on the manifold address, not the big D here. So that's approximation error. There are two things to notice. That's why the analysis is still a bit new. The first, these error are integrals not on the manifold, but in ambient space, where the density is near manifold. The second is this result that gets us uh, the same sigma in front rely on that the uh, RD, the ambient function of the constructed function is also bounded. 
Well, that's why we say that, I'm going to say next, that I need a universally bounded Lipschitz function, even approximate error go to zero. Given that, we can also have estimation error bound, which is actually independent of the network architecture because we have this uniformly bounded Lipschitz. So that the rate, again, depends on the small d, not the big d, and the constant uh, is, I mean, bounded by, we restricted to the uh, regularized function family. Um, the, I think I will still go to this slide and maybe save the rest. This is uh, a bit of the approximation. The traditional neural network cost approach like Yarosky typically give you a uniform approximation of error epsilon where the needed network complexity is proportional to epsilon to the minus d over small r, r's regularity, d's ambient space. So in the uh, uh, Shaham 18 paper, you have this approximation of manifold function, which kind of, in short, bring the complexity of big D to the small d uh, when the small r is 2. So notably, it's going to be, a pro n is going to be constructed a function from the neural network family. The uh, approximation is, is again uniform approximation on the manifold up to epsilon, and the needed neural, uh, neural network complexity has this term proportional to epsilon. And this term does, is kind of called intrinsic because only depends on the manifold and atlas. There is another term which does not change with epsilon that involves the essentially construction of the atlas by a neural network. So to illustrate the importance of the regularization, here is a picture. Think of our F star, which is the log density ratio is here, which even may not be in C infinity. And our assumption is that you have a target, which is here, and it's already sufficiently regular. We want to approximate that target function restricted to the manifold, okay, by a growing family that as it should go to small, the function family can be large. And uh, that's why we have a construction f con here. Now, important is the Lipschitz regularization because for this family to approximate f tar, the Lipschitz constant may not be bounded, it actually can be worse. Okay, so to prevent to write why we want a finite bounded Lipschitz, because on our assumption, the target function itself is Lipschitz, it's regular. Second, Lipschitz regulation also commonly used in proof. So if you want a bounded Lipschitz, you want to find the intersection of this family such that your f con is stay into another set whose Lipschitz constant, global Lipschitz constant, is uniformly bounded. So we're interested in the set of this, intersection of the two set. And uh, even as it goes zero, we want the f cons to stay here. So we show that this is indeed possible uh, by a more careful analysis of the uh, atlas and also importantly, uh, the extension into the ambient space by constructing an L2 tube around each atlas. It's a, it's a wavelet construction. That's why the Lipschitz, co the Lipschitz constant can be bounded by the wavelet coefficients. And uh, to address the question of arm manifold approximation, again, uh, our approach is by approximating this integral in the ambient space by the integral on the manifold. And uh, this difference can be controlled again by a careful use of atlas construction and the Lipschitz constant and the Lipschitz boundedness of the integral function uh, TF, T is the transform. So uh, the previous uh, uh, population loss L is exactly in this form. And this is more general result. This is possible by the sub-Gaussian decay. And combine this integral approximation of the neo-manifold density with the previous approximation result, we can have the theorem such that you can approximate the target function within the family, where at the same time have the bound, a uniform, a uniformly boundedness of the Lipschitz, and that allow us to prove this uh, of manifold. Uh, I, mean, I mean, prove this extension to the neoplanet density and have bounded the, the the term by a single sigma depends on the decay uh, factor of the density. So, I think that's what I want to say. And uh, unfortunately, I have no time to talk about the application, which is train a, basically train a classifier uh, to the RNA sequencing data. So kind of in the same spirit as this, but I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, very good. Thanks, Julian, for this uh, very nice talk. Any questions so far? Question? I have lots of questions. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure I got everything, but um, so it's too fast. It's too fast. Go ahead. Well, that's all right. I mean, I, I don't have a great background in all of this, but 
the error function that you were use or the the function you had basically like the expected for the one the true and the expected for the synthetic um based and with this function weighting or whatever it looks a lot like the wasserstein you're right instance. so what's the relationship between what you were doing and like a wasserstein distance like in a wasserstein gan or whatever Varsistan GAN is something that we actually hear a lot when we present this. So in Varsistan GAN, it's a great question, a great linkage. Uh, we are doing softmax training, which is the kind of the first generation of GAN, the old GAN, right? In Varsistan GAN, they don't do this softmax loss. They kind of maximize over, directly over VEF, where F has finite uh, bounded Lipschitz if it's W1, right? And then the question is, okay, how to approx so let me say that maybe it would be best to say that you actually in view of the MMD. If I can find a slide of the MMD. All right. So in the MMD, which is here, if you choose this to be the class of F has a Lipschitz uh, bounded by say one, then they have a one system wide distance by, by duality. Okay. Now, if you use neural network like what is again to, to do it, you try to regularize the network function to be, as we said here, similar, very similar, or maybe confusing, to be have finite uh, uh, bounded ellipses. And in practice, you get something else, which is, there are some analysis, which it depends on the neural, neural net arch architecture, because the family, if you don't, either you assume you can approximate uh, the function class of bounded ellipses, which is generally difficult, or you can restrict it to the function class provided by the neural network, which is another approach. So uh, our proof here in analysis is approximation. We kind of do a constructive proof that guarantee you the finite L evaluated F. And our Lipschitz function is, our Lipschitz regularization re uh, actually shows up due to another motivation because we want to uh, deal, we want the thing to be regular, we want to deal with off manifold uh, behavior. Because as you can imagine, in our case, we're interested in manifold data. You can approximate something on the manifold very good, but if you put a little bit away the manifold, uh, you actually, if you just look at our manifold approximation, you don't know what happened. So we would like the, also the function, not just doing a good job on manifold, we want it to be kind of smoothly going away manifold. That's why we restricted the, the Lipschitz there for our, for our purpose. Uh, it does not answer the estimation analysis of Wasserstein. We're not trying to uh, compute Wasserstein distance. We're still raising the from framework of our training, uh, basically we're training a classifier and get consistency. But uh, in a, on, a broad, on a, a broader related uh, topic, of course, Wasserstein is one thing. Uh, uh, W1 is of course an uh, important object which can be used for comparing distribution. But uh, I'm not sure actually what is the, yeah, what is the practical algorithm to compute a, a W1, the real W1, not the approximation in higher dimension, but maybe neural network will be a very good approach to do that. Yeah, I guess it, it looks really similar. And yeah. with the Lipschitz um, regularization, how does that correspond to like just regular regularization of my network, like if I do decay or? You mean weight decay? Yeah. Weight decay guarantee, well, if you suppose all the weights are decay and you, for example, that can induce, for example, your, if you put in your connect neural network, your matrix can have bounded, a certain bounded norm or something. And then by modifying those matrix together, if you deal with the, the euro ways to deal with the, the nonlinear transform using their non-expensiveness, you can prove, for example, a finite Lipschitz bound, which is a per linear perturbation bound in the Lipschitz type, type but that's the upper bound. So the, if I use some kind so of- it's a, Yeah, so it's actually not true. I think it's not trivial to be able to really apply the Lipschitz regularization to the network because it actually also depends on where the data lies. on. Okay, but if I apply the regularization, I kind of have upper bound on that. You, you have some upper bound, but uh, you actually don't know what is the Lipschitz bound, even if you apply, for example, with decay. And, and if you, um, uh, and, and if my data actually lives on this manifold, then I do better, right? I mean, with the, the method you're proposing. Uh, well, uh, the method we are, well, first, uh, the method we are proposing is actually new-ish because class, it, it's not very different from just training the classifier and grab the, test, the, 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 the output, the test function. We're using a logic. Mm -hmm. I, I guess we are trying to justify 
how much this can work. Um, and with the setting of data is like near manifold, that's in our interest because we are have our application data is basically in this case. So we are interested in the theory to justify why it works. Um, I can show you one picture, which I skip, which I think is illustrative of the effect of why manifold is relevant. Mm, and maybe I can finish after that. It's actually what I try to show, but I've not time to show about why manifold matters. This is a classification network approach. We have after the theory, we have an illustrative example of again one dimensional data. But lying in ambient space, which is this one. So this is a toy example. You have two densities in one dimension. Here they are lying on a curve in two dimensions. So I increase the ambient space by one. And I train the neural network. This blue dash is the population uh, Yeshin Sano divergence. So this is justified why in practice, when you're training, when your network is enlarged and when your sample is large, you can actually approach that just to justify our theoretical uh, assumption. And also we observe that at least in this toy example, how much this curve starts to bump bump up and uh, see the difference of the two density um, shows a similar trend when data is in one dimension or actually lying on the manifold near two dimension. That's why we, uh, that's why we kind of conjecture or believe that uh, manifold data matters because it's a complexity argument. In the case that you have data which is lying on or near to uh, a manifold in higher dimension, then what you need of the network complexity to, for example, for this two sample or comparing or classified business should be proportional to the intrinsic complexity of the data, which is intrinsic complexity of the density of the, of the manifold. For example, it should be the small d. That, that is, if your network can actually do a good job of building sufficient discriminant power along the manifold, it should be good for this data. You do not really need to cover everything in the ambient space to do that. So that's kind of the dimensionality argument and the complex argument we are in. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Very interesting. Sure. We have, actually, I have a, 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 another question. So when you when you prove the the, the, the the approximation of your neural network, so do you have any assumption about the training data? In, in other words, do you assume you can access any points you would like to have, or you pre-choose? some training data, then you say, I, this is just my training loss. Then I, you, based on that, I construct. I'm all naive and they use a sample. My, my LN is just uh, IID sample. I see, I see. And uh, the formula is uh, here. P hat just means uh, uh, summation of one over N tray of XI. Okay, okay. So it's, it's, like the traditional, it's the traditional only. machine learning setting. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, okay. But right. uh, what you mentioned is quite interesting. I think, uh, yeah, they call it interactive learning or something, right? You could do different weighting or actually can help many optimization. Mm -hmm. So but that's a general topic. I guess that can help anything, not just this, what we're still talking about today. Okay, very good. Very interesting. Any, any more questions? So if no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks so much. Very nice talk. Very, very, very happy to be here. And thank you again for coming and coming over to Zoom. Yeah, all right, okay. All right, so, yeah, yeah, and perhaps we should stop here. And uh, for those colleagues and the folks, uh, we will see you next time, Wednesday. Okay, great right. seminar. Thanks thank you me. again. Okay, all right. Bye. Should I do mine? Do mine? Send me the slides. Oh Just yeah, go. I will do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Well, in fact.